James in thanking John and Anna and George and everybody else and Peter, obviously, who was involved in the organising of this and then here. Yeah, thank you for um, for inviting me to come and talk. I hope you'll be gentle with me. This is my first time doing this, so fingers crossed. Um, I'd like to start by, by looking at, at the sort of proposed commons paradigm. Now, the idea, as I understand it, is that rather than seek individual or civil rights from the state, commoners will declare their sovereign rights as global citizens to protect, access, produce, manage and use shared resources. The proposal is to create commons trusts and social charters as a new way to manage resources which are, or at least should be, common to all. Again, as I understand it, this will be a multi-level paradigm from the local to the global in which the state will have to recognise those moral and political legitimacy of those people's rights that we said to preserve, access, produce, manage and use their own resources. Now, this is clearly, you know, it's a good way to organise things in the long term. It, it's, it's something that I think we should all be working towards, definitely. Now, in the preparations for this book, I'm actually going to quote James because he gave an excellent definition of the kind of implicit social contract. He said, as national citizens, we empower governments through implicit social contract, bestowing legitimacy and authority upon the state in return for the public goods of protection, security, infrastructure, and other services. In the normal scheme of things, in other words, resources that are common to all are safeguarded and managed by the state on behalf of the citizens. But the problem we all face, societies around the world face now, is that governments aren't doing that. They aren't adhering to the social contract. They've been entirely captured by market, corporate, or other special interests. Um, in other words, basically, the state no longer acts as the protector of the commons on behalf of the citizens. That's just not happening. Now, I think before jumping to any sort of answers about what we should be doing, I think we need to ask, how did this actually come to be? How did we get here? Because if we don't understand why it occurred, then the answer, we're not likely to come up with the right answers, to be honest. Now, Simpal argues that with the onset of globalisation and the global free movement of capital, there are some issues which just can't be solved by any one nation acting alone, or even a small group of this is because any one nation acting alone, unilaterally, to implement such a policy would put itself at a competitive disadvantage in the global marketplace, leading to job losses and capital flight. The policies to protect people on the planet would, in effect, be political suicide for any government implementing it because the increased costs it would place on its industries would just make them uncompetitive in comparison with industries elsewhere. Now, we believe that this is the key barrier solving many, many global problems and in particular explains even the lack of progress towards getting there to be honest. The governments, no matter what they do, what they propose to get elected must, once in power, constrain themselves to a narrow corporate market agenda in order to maintain their international competitiveness. Each nation fears the disadvantage of moving first on these issues and competes for the favour of global markets. In this way, we end up with a race to the bottom that offers very little hope for the future. Now, historically, as markets have expanded, they've always been matched by a kind of equivalent level of governance. But today, governance at the global level simply hasn't appeared in reaction to the phenomenon of the global market. As corporations have become transnational, have become global, we still have only a nation-state level of governance. This mismatch is, of course, exploited by globally mobile capital. We've all seen the effects of this. When, for example, legislation is proposed which is unfavourable to business interests, we hear that it will make our industries uncompetitive, that it will result in job losses and capital flight. In more extreme cases, corporations actually just threaten to up and move their entire operation to somewhere else where the conditions are more favourable. Now, some people have been tempted to blame corporations for this, accusing them of a kind of immorality almost. But the truth is they're subject to the same constraints that governments are. The corporation that acts alone, ethically, is the corporation that loses out to its competitors who aren't doing the same thing, but simply. It's therefore not surprising that global problems remain substantially unaddressed and indeed only get worse. 
in terms of their effects on society and the environment, it leads to a kind of rapacious, acquisitive urge, a vicious circle in which we've all come to recognise as being immensely damaging to our world. Now that, in turn, leads us on to the question of what is to be done about it, and that leads us, again, in turn, to the problem of ownership. Because if we want to see common resources properly managed in the true interest of society as a whole, we're forced to recognise, as we were talking, as James was saying earlier, that the vast majority of resources in the world are already owned by someone, if not by governments, then by corporations or other private interests. Now this is obviously a particular concern to the commons movement. Specifically, how do we get commons trusts or social charters in place where the resources already owned, such as raw materials, copper, coal, precious metals, whatever they may be, or if a resource is not yet under legal ownership, and it's hard to think of a valuable one that isn't, to be honest, how could it come under the ownership of a commons trust? And similarly, if a resource such as the global atmosphere, which is pretty much by definition unownable, how could we get it owned or managed by a commons trust? Now, in the first instance, where the resource is already owned, it would be necessary for the owners to voluntarily just hand it over to the commons, which, on the face of it, seems pretty unlikely. In the second instance, where a resource is not yet owned, commoners would have to kind of unilaterally claim control over it. And the question then is, by what right do they make that claim? And finally, in the instance of an unownable resource like the global atmosphere, commoners would have to actually claim unilateral control over that which is specifically argued not to be owned by anyone. And these doubts, I think, lead us to the crux of the matter. The question is whether it is the ownership and control of resources that's really at issue, or whether it's the ownership and control of our governments that should most concern us. Is the issue really about resource ownership, or is it rather a matter of citizens finding a way to ensure that their governments once again act as proper protectors of the commons on their behalf? Is it a question of claiming the global resource commons, or of reclaiming and democratising the global political I'd like to start my answer to that by giving a brief explanation of Simple. I know John sort of covered some of it earlier, but I want to talk a little bit about what it does and what it is. And then we'll explain how that relates to the vision set up by the Commons movement, obviously. And hopefully by then you'll be able to see that Simple and the Commons movement are mutually complementary and we can look at how to work together in the future. Although James has already sort of partly come into that anyway. Now Simple comes in two parts. The policy and the process. In the policy area, citizen supporters come together to create a range of policy measures to be implemented simultaneously when all or sufficient nations do likewise. Now I think that's quite important that it, to, to mention that the citizen supporters come together to create the policy because in that sense they make their politicians more like kind of passive conduits for the, the policy that they've created and that they are driving their governments to implement. And on the subject of that implementation, in the process, supporters use their votes in a novel way to drive their politicians to pledge to implement these measures. Simple supporters promise to vote in future national elections for any candidate within reason who has signed a pledge to implement Simple's range of policies alongside other governments. Or, if they have a party <coughs> preference, they will strongly encourage their preferred party to make that pledge. In this way, and with many seats and even entire elections these days being won or lost, on small margins, it doesn't take that many citizens to sign up, to start having a big effect and making it in the survival interests of politicians, regardless of party, to support their campaign. As John mentioned, we've already got a host of candidates on board and 24 of them are now sitting in Parliament having signed that pledge. Mm. By implementing a range of policy measures simultaneously, Simpol removes that risk of first mover disadvantage and so offers a win-win, level playing field for all, upon which genuine progress can be made. Simpol, then, is an answer to how the global political commons can be democratised. Now, there's one last thing I want to say about Simpol itself, for now, is to explain briefly how we define simultaneous policy. And this is quite important for reasons that will become clear in a minute. The simplest way to put it is that there are national and there are global issues. Global issues are the ones that I've been describing where any 
any nation acting alone would be placed at a competitive disadvantage by doing so. By contrast, national issues are those where the proposed policy either has no effect on the competitiveness or even has a positive effect to come to that. And obviously if that's the case, if, if there's a positive competitive effect by doing something first, then you would expect that country to be in a rush to get it done as quickly as they can and therefore preserve that competitive advantage. And so with those kind of national issues, Simpol takes no part in those. We only deal with the global issues that can't be dealt with unilaterally. So, in answer to my earlier question about how to solve these problems, a big part of the answer, I think, lies in splitting up the commons into two distinct areas. And this is where that split comes in, because it's kind of related, I guess. Direct commons are those where the resource in question is either not owned or can be released from ownership, either private or more likely government. These can be managed directly by commons trusts or social charters or whatever other organisation may come about. As a result, simultaneous policy wouldn't be required in those instances, and it would be up to commoners themselves to find the best ways to get those things handed over to them. But by contrast, there are those resources which either are already owned and cannot or will not be released, as well as those which cannot be owned, such as the atmosphere, and can only be managed via international agreement. These are the oceans, the atmosphere, these kind of things. These, then, are the indirect commons, common resources which can only be secured via a political process. They might, though, hopefully in light of the seminar title, be better referred to as the global political commons. And it's for the indirect commons at the global level where Simple comes in. We all recognise that our governments, our democracies, have been captured by this fear of first mover di competitive disadvantage, something we occasionally refer to as the phenomenon of destructive international competition, and by the interests of the few, basically. The point about Simpol is that it offers a powerful way to use the ballot box to recapture our governments and reclaim our democracy as a true global political commons. Only in this way can we drive governments to cooperate to enclose globally mobile private capital, and in doing so, bring it back under proper democratic control and accountability. This whole process is, in effect, nothing more than the people of the world claiming their sovereignty as we set out right at the beginning of this. But to do so, they must first learn to use their democratic rights in this transnational way that Simpol offers, so driving national governments forward towards global cooperation and government. Now, if we can collectively do that, then, then the people claiming their sovereignty and using that transnational cooperation in that way can create a bridge to the, the commons paradigm that's, that James did such a brilliant job of setting out. And then that, that paradigm can emerge and blossom to the benefit of us all. Thank you. in that coordinated way, we will drive them, we'll make it in their 
vital interest to, to support that range of policies and, in effect, to compete with each other to get that. I mean, if you've got... If, for example, you, you imagine an election in a marginal seat, you know, you wouldn't need that many people to sign up before it would become necessary for the politicians there to say, you know, I can't ignore that, that block of votes. You know, and then they're competing to support policies which previously they've been competing to avoid. You know, so it's 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 not about them. They they are the conduits for the will of the people, and that was how democracy was supposed to be in the first place. Um, so they we make them into the passive conduits. They're just the ones who enact it once we've decided what the policy is. Yeah, can I can I just emphasise that because I think maybe that's it. Um, wasn't wasn't clear originally because I, I, when I talk about simple, I tend to emphasise the voting process and how we, we bring politicians into very stiff, much stiffer competition by saying we'll vote for any of you within reason that signs up to this. But the, the important, the other side of simple is this policy side. In other words, we don't ask the politicians to make up a nice policy they can all agree to. No, we say we, you know, the, uh, members of simple, people who sign up to simple, say well. We are going to make our own policy, our own global policies, and that will include the token tax. That will include increasing corporation tax by 20% worldwide. It will include a whole lot of commons measure. We'll make our own policy, and then we'll say we will vote for any politician or party that signs up to it. You don't want to sign up to it, Mr. Politician. No problem, but you'll just lose your seat to the guy that will sign up. Yeah, and this is, you know, we're bringing them politics. This is the way that I, I feel we can. You know, if, if there's a, a democratic country, or ostensibly democratic country like the US, that is reluctant, citizens in the US have got to make, you know, make the electoral in the electoral survival interests of their politicians to sign up to Simpol. So if you have Britain having signed up to it, say in Germany and other countries, but there's one that's holding out, they won't hold out because if you have citizens that are supporting Simpol in that country, the politicians will have no choice. Because if they don't, their competitor will sign up and they've lost their seat. So they have to sign up. They just have no choice. Hey, yeah. Can I just follow that up? Because what was interesting about the token tax and the crisis in the last couple of years in Europe was that finally we had on the public stage a very simple example of what we're talking about, which was that actually some politicians in some, some countries in Europe had already been completely bought into it. And that the, although it wasn't handled very well in the UK, the UK was actually trying to say the simple message, well, you know, if we can't do it on our own, it won't work, Europe will go down the path. Now, the fact that that was up on the front pages of the national, international agenda, did that, in your experience, have any effect on the process that you've been engaged in for such a long time now, on people <coughs> finally getting the point? And what, what, it, what concerned me about that whole crisis was that somehow the, national, the international media didn't get hold of the point that actually what we should be doing was saying, well, what, what can we do to get everybody to agree then? Because this yeah. actually looks like a good thing. Right, right. Can, can, I, can I just answer? Yeah, no, sorry. Yeah, no, you're, you're, it's, it's a beautiful point, I think, because, and, and this is where I think the consciousness issue comes in. You see, when people hear David Cameron say, well, will they, are they, aren't we in Britain, will they only do this when everybody else does it? They immediately think, oh, well, he's just, that's just a spoiling tactic. And of course, maybe they're right in a sense, but people's consciousness hasn't yet gone up to the world-centric global level. Because if it did, they would see that actually Cameron's motives are immaterial. What is material is that we live in a global economy, therefore we must have simultaneous policies. It's like, duh, A, B, C, you know. Once you get to a world-centric level, you see it's just like, having local policies, national governance, and you know, global governance just becomes very obvious. But did that um, crisis then actually have a change of consciousness at that meta level across the world in the international media and in the international well, diplomatic circles? That's what I'm asking. Well, I, th I think that there will, there will sorry, you're, you're saying... Well, did it actually, because we... No, it didn't, no, it didn't, it didn't. And, I, and I'm saying it didn't What a happen. challenge we've got, I mean... Well, that's a challenge, case. it's a consciousness challenge, because I think that if people really realised um, you know, as you say, it's the bleeding obvious in a sense, isn't it? Um, if people re realised it as the bleeding obvious, you know, there wouldn't be 25 of us in this room. <laughs> we'd, we'd have packed out Wembley, you know. Um, but, but this is the challenge we're up against. And, and, um, uh, but it is, it is actually, you know, Cameron 
he's right. You know, he is absolutely right. And whether his, you know, whatever his motives may have been is another matter. Can I, sorry, can I just quickly add into that before we leave that question? I think perhaps it's a, it's a sign of hope, at least, you know, pre, prior to that, I, it would be hard to think of another instance where something like that did make the front pages of, of any media outlet, to be honest. So perhaps there's a little bit of hope in the fact that it is, and as more and more of those things come along, which they increasingly are going to, um, it should help to propel things along. I mean, we are up against a big challenge, yes, because that's not the way people see things, as John says, but it is a small sliver of light, perhaps, that, that people will begin to see that that's what's necessary. Just behind this, and, and also to look at how um, what the School of Commoning and the Global Commons Trust are about in relation to some famous uh, policy, I worry that over all the years that I've wrestled with these issues, I run into one comment and one question. The comment is, I'm not an economist, and it just kills the conversation. The second one is, are you an economist? <laughs> um, now, both of these seem to me bogged down with some view of experts that is destroying us. And that's why I put up these two maps, which is 35 years of work of, of um, James. The one on the left shows a total global economy, not as professional economists look at it, but as interdisciplinary people holding a value for life on Earth and understanding that life is gift. Um, Drawing together a picture of the global map like that shows the present map on the left, everything on the left, which is the personal and the commons capital, is in the negative, everything. It's a devastating picture. And on the right is the integral capital view, the interdisciplinary understanding of value and economy as the housekeeping of the globe, which takes account of all the insights about life on Earth that all the disciplines bring together. Now, my worry is that most people who look at those, and I show them to lots of people, say, I don't understand. And I say, you're not meant to understand, you're meant to feel. This is a visual metaphor of wholeness, not just as we're getting on television vividly now, through wonderful photography and trips uh, with the satellites where you look at the whole Earth, wonderful, wonderful things. But they are not, I'm coming down to that, uh, but they are not saying anything about economic order in terms of real housekeeping. So my question is, until we get a way of getting into everybody's mind, visual metaphors of wholeness, that they're always there, whatever they're about, we'll only have a very few debating at the level at which you've just been debating. That is my question. How are we going to get visual metaphors of true economy into people's minds? When there is a need, there is an awareness, there are tools, and there's a fierce urgency now. Um, I think what I would say is I wouldn't necessarily do it by just the economy, because economics is, is kind of necessarily quite reductionist. It reduces everything down to numbers, maths. Um, and it's, I don't think you can express a visual metaphor with maths. Although I suppose a computer programmer might disagree with me, but if you want to, to appeal to people kind of visually and this idea of wholeness, I don't think you can say that that can come through any one discipline. Really, I think people will come to it through a variety of ways, and to some extent, I think it will be kind of almost imposed on them by the conditions in the world as they are. They each person will bring their own visual metaphor. To it because they will experience the world uniquely as an individual person. So I guess that would be how I would see that happening. Jack, do you think you'd like to comment on that? Well, I do, I do think that pictures and maps are very important because they, um, they can stimulate people's own ability to make these pictures for themselves. So I do, I do think that it is important, and particularly like simultaneous. How would you illustrate that in a, in a map to make it, you know, to get the metaphor to come across? Mm -hmm. So I, I do think there's a, a, a real importance for what we call
called worldview, which is, you know, kind of a world picture, a visualization of wholeness that comes from our own experience. One of the ways I, I like to, it uh, wouldn't actually necessarily be a, a, a diagram or a, a visual uh, metaphor, but, but is, to, is to try to suggest to people that, you know, that, that it's a question of balance, and that if you have a global economy at you know, the global level, and you only have governance at the national level, there's a sort of mismatch, so there's an imbalance there, which of course anything that can move across borders will exploit. Um, or, or the other way of looking at it would be to say that, that market competition is, is, in a sense, the male principle. Um, cooperative governance is the female principle. It's the cooperative principle, the commons principle. But they're out of balance. You've got the male principle run, running rampant at the global level with you know, the global market. But the female principle is, is lagging behind at the national level. And we need to bring that up so that you, know, you, you have them both in balance. Maybe that's another way to visualize it. Uh, James, in America, there's a big movement for public conversations that mm -hmm. like, explore a lot of the, these kind of questions, uh, well, they explore questions that are global level and also specific questions. Do, have you been using any of these approaches to getting some of these messages across or using you know, that as a forum for um, mm -hmm. Conversations about these kind of questions, and we don't know the answer to many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have. Um, it's important to realize in the United States that civil dialogue has really gone to a low level, and we need to remind ourselves through public conversations that this is actually part of our heritage, and we need to be able to have these kinds of communications about important matters because the media has kind of taken over that role in many ways. They tell us what to think rather than have us get together. And, and actually have a structured environment or an or informal environment in which we can have an open exchange of views. And so, yes, we've been we've been using that kind of um, that that kind of uh, format. But I think that goes along with the lines of what the Commons is anyway, because because what you're referring to really is an information or knowledge Commons, and it's important to share that and think of it as a resource that people share, and therefore. It's not being managed, but there, it's actually a commons that's producing value because people will come away from there with particular ideas that they hadn't thought of before. So that's really a, a very good example of a commons that we are tapping into. Okay, I, I would suggest we 